So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. S. K. Mishra, the uh, very on, uh, distinguished, uh, eminent speaker for this afternoon, uh, Honorable Mr. N. K. Singh, all the members of the board of ISID, and very distinguished participants for this lecture. I, uh, it is a um, pleasure and honor for me to welcome you all to the first Professor S. K. Goel Memorial Lecture organized by ISID uh, in honor of its founder, whom we lost this February. And in Mr. N. K. Singh, uh, we have a very distinguished speaker to start this lecture series. And he has also chosen a very uh, timely theme uh, financing for development for this first lecture in this series. So without any further ado, I want to invite uh, uh, Mr. S.K. Mishra, the Chairman of Board of Governors of ISID, to deliver his opening remarks and invite Mr. Singh to deliver the, the lecture. Over to you, sir. My dear and esteemed friend, N.K. Singh, distinguished guests, Professor Nagesh Kumar, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to welcome you here to the first Professor S. K. Goel Memorial Lecture organized by ISID. Let me begin by saying a few words about the lecture series we are initiating today. This annual lecture series honors the memory of late Professor S. K. Goel, who visualized ahead of his time the relevance of a dedicated institute for policy research and advocacy for industrial transformation of India. Having noticed the lack of suitable and reliable data on the industrial sector, and having realized the importance of the corporate sector for a modern industrial economy, Professor Goel assembled a group of young scholars at the Indian Institute of Public Administration, IIPA, where he was Professor of Economic Administration in the early 1980s, with the support of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR, to work on building an organized database and policy research on the sector. The Corporate Studies Group, known as CSD, came, uh, came out with the widely noticed studies like functioning of the industrial licensing system and small scale sector and big business under Professor Goy's leadership during 1983-84. <clears throat> the Corporate Studies Group was eventually institutionalized in the form of ISID in 1986. Professor Goel envisaged a well-equipped campus of the Institute and left no stone unturned to realize that dream. After operating for many years from the barracks in the Rind, Niketan, and IP estate, IC finally moved to his well appointed campus in Vasant Kund Institutional Area in New Delhi in 2006, which was inaugurated by Dr. Manmohan Singh, the then Prime Minister of India. Professor Goel passed away on 4th February 2021, leaving behind a rich legacy. To honor the memory of Professor Goel, the Board of Governors, ISID, endorsed a proposal to endorse, to institute the lecture series. I believe we could not have found a better person than my good friend N.K. to deliver the inaugural lecture in the Professor Goel Lecture Series. As the audience knows, Mr. N.K. Singh is a highly renowned economist, academic, and policy maker. He served as chairman of the 15th Finance Commission. He also served as a member of the Upper House of Parliament, the Raj Sabha, from 2008 to 2014, during which time he contributed to several prominent parliamentary standing committees, including the Public Accounts Committee, the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and the Committee on Human Resource Development. Mr. Singh has had a long and distinguished career as a member of the Indian Administrative Service before his entry into politics and fiscal policy leadership. As one of the country's top bureaucrats, he has handled important portfolios, such as Secretary to the Prime Minister, Expenditure and Revenue Secretary, and member planning commission. 
He was part of the core group of advisors and strategists during India's economic reforms of 1991 and the principal interlocutor for negotiations with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund for special adjustment loans and balance of payment support in humanities. Mr. Singh has just been elected president of the Institute of Economic Growth. He's also a member of the governing board of Nalanda University. He is also a published author with several prominent books in his name. His autobiography, Portraits of Power, Half a Century of Being of Insight, has received wide acclaim, and which I have enjoyed very much reading. I am grateful to NK for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture and for fitting in a very tight schedule this month, which happens to be the month of Professor Goel's birth. I am also grateful to him for picking up a very topical theme mm -hmm. of financing for development for his lecture. Given the many, many challenges of development, such as closing the gaps in the physical and social infrastructure, the provision of healthcare and food security to our teeming millions, meeting the challenge of climate change, reviving MSMEs badly hit by COVID-19 pandemic, providing livelihood security to millions rendered jobless, all this and more, all impinge on finance. Where do we get the resources to finance all the needs of the country? Is a key challenge, challenge that the policymakers face. I'm sure all of us are eager to listen to Mr. Singh's analysis and answers on the most fundamental challenges of our times. NK, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me at the outset uh, thank you, the chairman of the Institute of Studies in Industrial Development, my old friend, uh, S.K for the privilege and opportunity to share my thoughts with you on a subject of contemporary relevance. We all know you, SK Misha, has been a builder, a builder of institutions, of causes, making success out of challenges. I'm one of your more abiding admirers. Dr. Nagesh Kumar, who has invested new life and new purpose to this institution to, to, to structure it and realize the objectives of late Professor Goel. Indeed, we are addressing these opportunities with zest and fervor. This lecture is being held in the memory of Professor S.K. Goel, who was born, as Mr. Mishra said, in this very month, but left us suddenly in February. In October, therefore, we will from now on, since this is the first in the lecture series, recall and celebrate his birthday and his contribution. I had come in close contact with Professor Goel when he was a close associate of the <coughs> former prime minister, late Sri Chandrasekha. He was the founder of this prestigious institution and as advisor to the late prime minister was actively associated with economic policies initiated during that period and the several courageous steps which were taken to mitigate the enveloping balance of payments crisis. The firefighting measures which were implemented during that difficult period ensure that the fair reputation of India of never reneging on debt or its inability to meet its international obligations remained unsoiled and undented. These had required courage and concert to which Professor Goel was a party. Apart from this, of course, as was just pointed out, he had worked on commercial banking in India, prepared a credible roadmap along with the corporate study group of which he was a, an active member. His work on monopoly capital and public policy had implications for the management of our balance of payments crisis. We had worked, that is Mr. Goel and I, had worked and discussed many of these issues during that critical phase of our economic management. I share one more bond with him, namely that both of us were alumni 
of the Delhi School of Economics, uh, having been elected recently as the president of the Institute of Economic Growth, which for a long time was part and parcel of the Delhi School of Economics and has since maintained a symbiotic relationship with that institution. We share this, I share this bond with Professor Goel. He had equally worked closely with the Dr. Manmohan Singh, who at that time was the advisor of late Prime Minister Chandrasekhar, and subsequently, we all know the architect of India's liberalization endeavors. The theme of my lecture today is financing for development. This is a broad issue because the resources needed for multifaceted and inclusive development is a collective effort of many stakeholders. No doubt, public outlays, which have a direct and catalytic impact, need to be financed by the central and the state government. The financing needs of the general government, therefore, significant as they are, must be consistent with overall macroeconomic stability. This means debt sustainability and manageable fiscal deficits. A significant stakeholder in the process is a corporate sector, large, medium, small, and micro. Their development plans, ambitious as they may be, need savings after a significant foreclosure to meet the needs of the government, both central and the state. External capital and borrowings need terms and conditions of debt which are acceptable. Project viability, and particularly long-term project viability, needs low cost, long debt sources, both from internal and external sources. Enhancing total factor productivity implies incremental improvement in the capital output ratio and harnessing nascent technology. The multiplier effects of digital technology in all our economic activity will alter the culture of innovation. Harnessing demographic dividend necessitates investment in human capital, education, and health. And a burst of innovation dramatically alters the productivity curve of the economy. These are integral to development dynamics. The issue of our medium-term growth potential projected by the International Monetary Fund very recently, in fact, last week, by recalibrating it by half percentage point downwards from 6.5 to 6%, which means around 10.5% nominal GDP growth, 10.5% uh, uh, nominal is in my view, a gross underestimation. Calculation of growth potentials are always problematic. Using methods that determine the trend in the cyclical part of the GDP using statistical techniques and structural models have been the traditional course. One of the main methods is a Roderick Prescott filter, which extracts a trend reasonably in line with the evolution observed in output, which is smooth and does not change too much from year to year. This is dependent, this smoothness is dependent on a number of fact, basic production <laughs> factors, labor and capital, which are relatively inertial, and the new technologies in that model are slow to spread. This makes contemporary estimations of potential growth rates more problematic. In the Finance Commission, which uh, Mr. Misha referred, the 15th Finance Commission, over the medium term, we have projected a nominal GDP growth of 11.5% in the terminal year of our award, implying a real GDP growth of around 7%. No doubt, this is also an underestimation because we need to bump up our growth rates in real terms significantly higher to meet the inescapable obligations of large public outlays, which need to be financed both in social and physical infrastructure. For the long run, poverty elimination remains our central priority. We must escape and ensure that poverty, those who escape from poverty, do not go back into poverty on account of exogenous factors. This is of course contingent on significantly enhanced public outlays. 
a rising curve of public outlays, if not matched with enhanced savings, can be debatable. And how much of it is starving private sector to finance their investment needs? With, is it going to be crowding in effect through investments for, for enhanced opportunities for private investment? The line of distinction, therefore, between crowd out and crowd in needs careful calibration based on a number of evolving factors. At any rate, even for financing a sustained 7% real GDP growth numbers, consistent with macroeconomic stability, needs restructuring our resource mobilization and endeavors. I say this because even before the pandemic, resource availability has been a persistent challenge for many federations across the world. Although tax revenues in India, over time, there has been some general improvement. Unfortunately, India is among the lowest of the three BRIC countries below the OECD average, given the smaller proportion of population that pay income and property taxes. The tax revenues of both the union and the states pre-pandemic were just 17% of the GDP remaining constant since the early 1990s. The cesses and surcharges earmarked by the union government have also increased over time to about 15% of gross revenues. There is need to raise India's tax ratio, both from a macroeconomic and redistributive perspective, and also enhancing the fiscal space for financing of public outlays. International experience suggests that comprehensive tax reforms can be implemented without imposing higher burdens on the poor with greater progressivity in the tax structure. The move towards a goods and services tax is therefore a move in the right perspective. In respect of GST, it must first and foremost be recognized that it was and has been a path-breaking reform. While it commenced in the 1990s, and in discussions with international organizations in multiple ways, moving from an integrated VAT to an integration of variable and differentiated excise matrix of states, its formal announcement had to await broader consensus in 2017. It is only under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and the great leadership provided by late Finance Minister Mr. Arun Jaitley that we were able to forge a consensus with the states for the far-reaching constitutional amendments leading to the GST. The recent revenue data over the last few months have also suggested an encouraging revenue trend from the GST, making up for a lot of lost time. Nonetheless, there are some serious medium-term challenges as far as GST is concerned. First, the inverted duty structure, which implies multiple rates and the balance in the structure of intermediates with final products have important revenue implications. As we pointed out in the Finance Commission's report, and I quote, one of the important reasons for, for the higher than 50% input tax credit is the inverted duty structure on many items. This can be corrected even without the weighted effective tax rate going up with a salutary impact on net revenue collections of the general government, unquote. Second, on compliance. I mentioned the issue of fake invoices in the Finance Commission's report. By recalibrating the technology platform, by overcoming the technical glitches, which can break, bridge the yawning gap between realization and potential. Third, the issue of the revenue neutral rate, which is a challenging one. In the Finance Commission's report, we have said, and I quote, a change in tax revenue can be said to be revenue neutral if the modified tax is able to realize the revenue comparable to the original tax regime relative to the tax base, unquote. From this point of view, the average GST rate currently hovering around 11% needs a fundamental change. There have been different approaches to this approach. The task force appointed by 
the Finance Commission, or earlier projected by even the 13th Finance Commission, projected a revenue neutral rate of 12%, IMF 11.6%, the NIPFP 17%, the former Chief Economic Advisor suggested 15%. We in the 15th Finance Commission proposed a model in which we projected a recalibration of the GST over the medium term, including broad banding of rates. Anecdotally, and the chairman will know about this period of mine, anecdotally, long ago, when as revenue secretary, I had worked the contours of the GST, I had proposed a revenue neutral rate just a touch below 16%, a goal which has remained elusive. Compressing, however, 12 and 18 percent into a rate consistent with the revenue neutral range could make a fundamental difference. Second, the issue of leaving aside the issue of the GST in respect of streamlining of the customs duty structure, three important steps need to be taken. One, broad banding industrial finished products. Two, broad banding intermediate industrial products and industrial raw materials. Three, continuing with zero rating of imports to facilitate global value added chain exports and streamlining the non-tariff barriers. In respect of direct taxes, which is an area that requires significant change, is the personal income tax. It is a strange area of a very skewed tax realization pattern. Consider the following. Out of 5.53 crore individuals, which means a little over 50 million crore individuals who filed returns in this segment, 40% and more did do not pay any tax. Another 53.2% whose annual income average rupees 5.6 lakhs paid a tax of rupees 23 1,538 each on an average, which means an effective tax rate of only 4%. Their contribution to the tax collection thus accounted for just 21%. The the remaining 6.3% accounted for about 79% of the tax collection under the personal income tax. This skewed picture emerges because of a plethora of exemptions and deductions, lack of effective surveillance, and also the structure of the tax slabs and rates. Undoubtedly, having opted for a moderate tax rates, we need to move forward in implementing the recommendations relating to personal income tax by reviewing exemptions under different tax laws, expanding coverage of provisions relating to tax deduction at source, TDS, which is tax deduction of source, and a tax collection of source, which is TCS, to capture more transactions, leaving behind an audit trail and a closer congruence between agencies to bridge the gap between TDS and TCS. We have taken some credible steps recently to improve settlement and realization of a large stock of disputed tax demands. We need to pursue this by creating a mindset of departmental resolution, assigning of powers for freeing up tax litigation and adjudicatory institutions being strengthened. Fourth, there is an issue, not an unimportant issue, particularly for the state governments relating to stamp duties, where higher the stamp duty, the greater the propensity to undervalue property both stamp duties reforms and property tax reforms are thus the flip side of the same coin. Moving forward in respect of corporate taxes, India has taken the audacious step in September 2019 to a base rate of 22% for those companies we do not avail of exemptions. Our tax rates, corporate tax rates, I mean, compares now very favorably to other competing investment destinations. 
in the Finance Commission. We made some important recommendations which over a five-year period will lead and more than compensate for the revenue lost on account of a reduction in the corporate tax rates given leaps and lags of responses by new investment. Finally, a comment on rationalizing professional taxes. Unfortunately, SK, you may or may not know, but Nage should know, uh, far too many lawyers have been finance ministers of India. So I comment on the professional tax. Unfortunately, the current figure of just 2,500 professional tax was fixed in 1988, and it came through, strangely, a constitutional amendment. This is unscientific. It has no basis. It is an important source of revenue to the third tier institutions, and we should make necessary constitutional amendments, which defreezes this and indexes it to inflation. We had calculated that from the implicit GDP deflator for each year, by this method, the upper ceiling of annual professional tax of 2,500 fixed in 1988 would work out to rupees 18,000 at 1920 prices, freeing up the professional tax from the unscientific methods and making necessary appropriate changes in the constitution will go a long way in improving the finances of both local bodies and state governments. In summary, we suggest the following five steps. One, undertake revenue administration reforms in parallel with tax policy changes. Two, broaden the base for both direct and indirect taxes by reducing exemptions and improving compliance. Third, shift the focus to indirect taxation through value-added tax with simplification and greater efficiency being key drivers of revenue gains. Fourth, sustain the revenue increase through administrative reforms in key compliance areas, including risk-based audits, filing, and reporting. Build, uh, finally, revenues from local and enhance revenues of local governments through property taxes. This must be all seen in a broader context, not only of the stagnant revenue to GDP for a decade and the inability to meet financing requirements compared to other peer group countries. We had requested the International Monetary Fund for a detailed study, which came to the somewhat starkly conclusion that the large gap in tax collection is more than 5% of GDP compared to its potential. Now, if uh, Nagesh knows the 1% of GDP is 2,50,000 crores, just this 5% of GDP gives you, bridging this gap, brings you the necessary resources for significantly enhanced uh, public outlays. I now come broadly to the general theme a public-private partnership, a concept which for multiple reasons, the expected blend between private capital, managerial practices and innovations being harmonized with project financing or financing to public outlays has unfortunately been a mixed experience. There is no doubt about some notable successes which such partnerships have benefited all stakeholders, most importantly, the consumers themselves. There are others where the private sector has complained of excessive bureaucratization, absence of autonomy, and an onerous compliance culture. Very often, many such uh, arrangements are pejoratively been referred as sweetheart deals, where large public outlays and investments have not been able to secure the expected value of returns. The issue, therefore, of assignment of risks, risk mitigation, insurance against emerging exogenous and sudden risks beyond the force majeure has eluded consensus. There was a proposal by my very good friend some time ago by a committee headed by the eminent economist, Dr. Vijay Lakshman Kilka, which came to a similar conclusion. The needs of the economy, he had argued, would be to have a legal architectural framework 
on public-private partnership, which could mitigate risk, add to comfort, and be able to harness this huge potential which exists. Emerging issues, like for instance, retrospective amendment of contracts based on not only emerging technologies, but on accordance with revised perceptions has stymied entrepreneurial instincts and prevented large private capital flows. The broad issue of risk mitigation, modalities of mitigation, and the modes of financing options need greater consensus. Finally, I want to come to an issue which was uh, mentioned a uh, passé by you, Mr. Chen, on the issue of climate change and the energy transition. I want to make a comment or two on the growing needs of the sovereign to undertake the climate, the energy transition. India provided a great degree of leadership at the last COP25 in Paris, which resulted in the International Solar Alliance. Since we are on track to fulfill our nationally determined contribution of reducing emission intensity by 33 to 35% of GDP by 2030, and the prime minister's recent call for one sun, one world, one grid, has international resonance and a force of great moral appeal. Nonetheless, for a country like India, an orderly energy transition casts a huge burden on the financial resources of the union and the states. An orderly energy transition is nonetheless inescapable. But consider the following. India's per capita energy emission is among the lowest in the world, and has a long way to go before it approximates, leaving aside the developed countries. India may be the, the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases below United States and China, but our per capita income <coughs> is one-tenth of the United States and one-third of China. is far lower in power consumption, <coughs> 9 kilohertz per person, which is just 8% of US, and perhaps 20% of China. Yet addressing issues of poverty, improving life quality, improving quality of physical and social infrastructure, and improving human resource skills will inevitably require cleaner sources of energy by a factor of even six to seven times. The issue of an appropriate carbon tax, which overcomes issues like carbon arbitrage, has been in recent focus. In a very recent article written by the visiting director general of the WTO, Negozi Okambe Iwala, he calls the familiar Stern Stiglitz Commission on carbon pricing between $50 to $100 per ton of COT as carbon tax. Who will bear the burden of this tax? How is this tax to be realized and transferred in the manner? which does not cripple our exports through new forms of non-tariff barriers, continuing to use trade as an important engine of growth needs meeting orderly financing arrangements for enabling our energy transition to a new energy economy. At the same time, reducing fossil fuel drastically to enhance solar power, so to say, to say, 5,600 gigawatts by 2070 is a critical issue. The human resources and livelihoods of those engaged in current fossil fuel production, like coal, has a huge economic cost. Simultaneously adopting to energy changes, mitigating its impact and building an energy resilient infrastructure is equally costly. Public outlays have serious fiscal constraints. Garnering private capital is a competitive game, as also access to newer technologies. We need multiplicity of action to enhance our domestic resource capability. The international community and the multilateral development banks must readapt their lending norms in imaginative ways and create buffer insurance arrangements for private capital and risk mitigation 
which is central to this exercise. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I've sought to briefly outline some of the development challenges and possible financing modalities. Inevitably, improving our revenue performance by implementing some of the measures which I have mentioned would be central to this objective. Our development challenges have, however, become increasingly more complex. A new architecture to buttress public-private partnership would be inevitable and inescapable. Harnessing the resources of multilateral institutions, both for providing additional capital, but more importantly, risk mitigation for crowding in of private capital will be an ongoing challenge. This is an area where availability of public and private capital using multilateral institutions imaginatively is a path forward. Financing development needs resolve implies resolving legacy issues. It equally implies addressing new challenges. A multifaceted approach is a path forward. Finance for development must be viewed in a broader context or development means. Long ago, Einstein had very correctly said, and I quote, all that is valuable in human society depends upon the opportunity for development accorded to individuals, unquote. Development must accord opportunities to individuals. It is about transforming the lives of peoples, not just transforming economies. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity for enabling me to share some of my thoughts on, on financing for development. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh, for giving us a scintillating and very erudite, uh, and very comprehensive, insightful uh, talk which uh, covers the entire gamut of issues and challenges that the country faces in raising the revenue and uh, through direct and indirect taxes, and also uh, your uh, you know, emphasis on building a new architecture uh, for raising resources through uh, involvement of uh, all other stakeholders, and uh, in particular, emphasizing on the potential, on harnessing the potential of public-private partnerships is very timely. I think I am sure that a number of our uh, colleagues and uh, participants would like to uh, pose some questions to uh, take this discussion forward. So I want to just look around who are the people who want to, wanting to make a comment. I see Mukul Asher from National University of Singapore raising a hand. So Mukul, uh, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself and go ahead, please. You are still muted, Mukul. Not able to, ah, yes. no, yeah, yeah, no, I can okay. unmute. Yes, okay. okay. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Thank you very much, Nagesh. Uh, the, it is always, a great delight and a learning experience to hear Mr. N.K. Singh. I remember hearing him in Singapore about 30 years ago. And the, uh, the question that I have is the following. Recently, IMF uh, in particular has been emphasizing the possibilities of using balance sheet of the government to generate revenue in an unconventional way. The taxes and others, the, the agenda that you have suggested is indeed uh, very useful, needed, uh, but to raise effective tax rates in the current environment uh, is going to be challenging. What would be your view on IMF's suggestion for using government balance sheets 
to raise revenue. Thank you very much, Mokul. It's so nice to hear from you, uh, since you recall uh, with such abiding affection my uh, interaction 30 years ago. Time has really floated. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thanks for coming for today's. Now, you know, um, you ask an interesting question uh, and a provocative one, if I may say so. So uh, what does this imply? Uh, as a good economist yourself, uh, you would see for yourself. I see this in uh, uh, two dimensions. So if you use the balance sheet of the government, which is what the IMF suggests, it implies that sovereigns must have a sovereign country rating. Because obviously, you cannot use your balance sheet your balance sheet, the sovereign's balance sheet, without subjecting the sovereign to an independent rating by standard rating agencies. So that's, a, that's something, uh, Mukul, which was suggested to me in 1991 by the International Monetary Fund. And uh, I said, look, I can get the corporates rated because they are under the corporate balance sheet. But uh, uh, getting the sovereign rated at a time when uh, you know that the rating are not likely to be favorable is hardly an exercise which will have multiplier virtues because it will only greatly enhance the cost of my international borrowing further for the sovereign themselves, and of course, for the corporates uh, dependent, uh, dependent on the sovereign. Now, where the things have changed very significantly is in two dimensions, three dimensions. One, India's corporate sector, which was nascent then, has come of age. Many India's corporate sector has been borrowing and has borrow it rather creatively, imaginatively, effectively. And it has come to play an increasingly dominant role. Our ability on software, harnessing of technology, the permeation of technology has altered international perspectives on India. Nonetheless, and that's a very sore subject with me, Mokul. Nonetheless, the rating agencies in a very, very, I wouldn't use the word prejudice, but in some inexplicable methodology, continue to rate India uh, just above the investment grade. Is that fair? If you look at our uh, debt to GDP numbers, yes, prior to pandemic, when I chaired the Fiscal Responsibility Management Committee, the debt to GDP of the rate of was about 68%. And I had projected at that time that this 68% to go down to 60 in a five year period, 40% by the central government, 20% by the states. All that has changed. Debt to GDP currently, given the pressures of fiscal numbers, some mortality growth rate um, in various quarters before, and the fact that the pandemic has uh, really pushed the government on the fiscal envelope uh, very significantly. Our debt to GDP looking upwards of uh, close upwards of 85% uh, or so. So uh, all that one could do is push the 85 down in a five year period for which uh, uh, the, the sovereign has ex accepted uh, my award and recommendations in a southward direction. And in normal circumstances, rating agencies do not look to numbers. They look to the direction. There are no absolute means on what is an ideal debt to GDP for a low middle income country uh, of a size of India. Uh, they say 60. Why not 62? Uh, why not 65? Consider Mukul the fact 
that when I asked one of the major rating agencies that you are permitting many other countries, 243% uh, debt to GDP without drop, batting an eyelid. Oh, but they are not, uh, their per capita income is significantly higher. I said, but look at our reform efforts and so on. So these are problematic issues. And that is why I do not share, in short, the IMF suggestions for using my balance sheet. There is one more aspect to it before I, uh, many thoughts have come that India is sitting on a pile of reserves. In fact, growing reserves, to, while reserves were a big problem in 1991, reserves are a source of embarrassment considering the accretion in the foreign exchange reserves of the central bank. So some thoughts have come with a part of that reserves can be used more imaginatively for and more constructively. And these are thoughts on which the central bank uh, is giving, uh, is, it is for them to consider. But do not, of course, even while considering this, do not forget that these are not our resources. They are private money, which has come to accrue to the resources and to our reserves. Of course, you can take the view that uh, push comes to shove, even for a rainy day, since it's unlikely to be a mass scale withdrawal, should you not think of uh, uh, imaginative ways for harnessing this resource. These are ideas which are in a dynamic float and the central bank is best, uh, um, best positioned to take a reasonable view on it. So my short point is uh, that uh, as we proceed, as growth rates go up, uh, this year, it is very commendable. I mentioned that the GST numbers have looked up. Our fiscal deficit numbers look to be, for the, after several years, closer to the a realistic BE. Also give the finance minister the fullest marks that uh, the old criticism, uh, Mokul, that our data was lacking credibility because it failed to take into account uh, contingent liabilities of market borrowings and sovereigns. For the first time, this is the clean data having provided for the huge stuff on the small and medium. And the budget for the first time presents the full picture of the contingent liability and guarantees. So we are making progress, uh, but uh, not in the ways that the International Monetary Fund, in fact, to the International Monetary Fund, my suggestion is, that do not go by a mechanical correlation between quota holdings and the extent of access to a borrowing. Look at a different kind of a parameter. And particularly for the special SDR of which you have allocated, please look to a different formula in really assigning the SDR to different countries. Look at the fact of our climate financing need, which I mentioned. And I think that should have some relationship with the fact that uh, my per capita emission, per capita emission is one of the lowest. So I think that the uh, multilateral institutions will have to do a lot of restructuring among themselves before they, ex they expect us to bite uh, Sadeh like this. Thank you very much, Mukul. Thank, thank you, sir. I, I see some hands from my colleagues, but before that, I just want to check whether uh, Professor Taneja or Professor Swaminathan, Mr. Dili Pratha, uh, any one of you want to raise a question before I ask my colleagues to move on? Yes, Professor Swaminathan, go ahead, please. You are muted. You are muted still. Hello. Uh, can someone unmute? Yes, yes. I think now you are unmuted. Yes, go ahead, no. please. The host had muted me, sir. I was trying oh, to really? tell you. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. 
Um, yeah, I, uh, very quickly, sir, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, um, it was very, a very learning experience for me. This is not my area. Uh, I just wanted to um, pick your brain a bit about this adage, good economics is not necessarily good politics. What do you think would be the political challenges that you would face for some of the suggestions that you have made, which may be unpalatable to any political class? So, Professor Swaminathan, this is a, uh, I wish I knew the answer, uh, because uh, this is a billion dollar question. Um, but um, one, if I may give you a short reply, uh, permit me for that. Uh, if I may say so, federalism is desirable. Uh, cooperative federalism is even more desirable. Competitive federalism is a great aspiration. But what if I turned the question and said, how about competitive populism? So one of the big challenges is that the cycle of election in this country is such that how does one duck the pressures of competitive federalism, given the fact that the onset of state elections, the commitments as a result of that can do years of very steady, dedicated work on macroeconomic stability. That is going to remain a medium-term challenge. How does one mitigate the debilitating impact of competitive populism, which does not jeopardize the macroeconomic stability? Yes, uh, I see a hand raised by uh, Dr. Dilip Rata from the World Bank. Go ahead, please. You are muted. Ah. Our IT, uh, hello, uh, Dhananjay, can you unmute Dr. Dalit? Yeah, you are. Yeah, yes. Oh, thank you. I can see now I'm unmuted. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kumar. I um, first wanted to congratulate Dr. Singh for a wonderful presentation. And uh, um, before I ask my question, I wanted to also uh, fondly remember um, Mr. Goyal and uh, as a father figure, um, his uh, uh, son and daughter uh, are my friends. And uh, I have had many evenings in his place um, and, and I, I, I miss him. Uh, I also wanted to respectfully remember what a great uh, a visionary he was. Um, I, I remember when I was in the private sector and all um, um, very enthusiastic about foreign investment, liberalization and all that in, in the sort of mid nineties. And um, when I said, um, you know, foreign direct investment should be allowed. Um, and, and I said, if you, that was a question was foreign direct investment in consumer sector, you know, would you allow that? And, and there was a lot of controversy in the mid nineties, late nineties, if you remember. So I said, um, if you let a guest come into the house, would you stop him from going to the kitchen? And he quickly asked, um, and how about would you stop him from going to the bedroom? Um, I thought I, I was, that was a sharp question. Uh, uh, you know, obviously somebody who had thought through this uh, and then Enron happened, right? Uh, that was a pre-Enron days. So that was one. The second was, I remember the cataloging of uh, news items um, that he was doing at that time in a very uh, methodical way. ISID has probably the, one of the best archives of news uh, reports from those days. And I was really impressed. Those were pre-internet days. And the third thing was some conversation about the big vision. How about building, let's say, a railway or a highway all the way from Singapore to, let's say, London? 
uh, I mean, there were you could have conversations of that kind. So that was just to remember him um, fondly and respectfully. And to Dr. Singh, um, I fondly remember, sir, our, 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 our meetings at the Global Commission on International Migration. And I think you chaired the meeting or you were the commentator when we launched the Global Economic Prospects Report on Remittances and Migration in the World Bank, uh, again in 2006, I believe. And um, a question to you, uh, to what extent India could leverage on its diaspora either through remittances or through diaspora bond, similar to the resurgent India bond or the Indian willing <laughs> deposits for financing development. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dilip. Uh, uh, first of all, I also have many uh, happy memories, creative memories, constructive memories, and visionary ideas of Professor Goel. I equally cherish uh, them as, as you do. Uh, yes, Dilip, when you ask, put your hand, uh, my thoughts immediately flash to the pioneering work done by you on the remittance economy. I never failed to read the exceedingly analytical work on the power of remittance economy and its behavioral pattern over time. And I think that was one of the most creative part of the World Bank's uh, approach to this very complex uh, set of issues. Uh, uh, so I, I, I really enjoyed your analytical skills and the sort of data which you put forward uh, during, those, uh, during that period. Your question is uh, about uh, making creative use for diaspora bonds. Uh, uh, you know, Dilip, uh, uh, we have resorted to this earlier. Uh, if you look at the Wells um, payments history of India on several critical occasions, given the tenuous state and the fragile state uh, of our balance of payments, the diaspora community uh, repeatedly uh, and sometimes a touch generously uh, subscribed to many of these bonds, which helped us uh, buttress and shore up our uh, overall balance of payments. Uh, some periods in time, uh, uh, the cost of such bonds uh, were proving to be somewhat misaligned with what would have been creatively. If you remember, the last big resort was really when uh, uh, the former governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, Raghuram Rajan, in order to mitigate and offset the uh, paper tantrum, and it's having its uh, adverse impact on excessive volatility of the currency, uh, did uh, some creative efforts in that, uh, at, uh, which of course, had its own positive value, of course, the cost was not. So I think as far as today's context is concerned, I'll just make two uh, comments. One is that uh, if anything, the central bank is flushed with embarrassment of riches, not poverty of riches, uh, as far as the foreign exchange is concerned. It's a question of how the central bank is going to manage this without an excessively adverse impact on the stability of our exchange rate and not allowing the, uh, the rupee generally to float up uh, too much, which could hurt our exports uh, and certainly in the short run, if not over the medium term. Second, the more, the more positive way of looking at it, is instead of diaspora bonds, provide them opportunity for investments in India. Instead of subscribing to a bond, perhaps opportunity for the multiplicity of investment avenues uh, with which India is now have experiencing a new bout, look at uh, all these new nascent economies uh, which have come up. Look at the new ventures which have come up. Uh, look at the ability of a young Indian to float these uh, kind of very creative, imaginative opportunities for investment. So given the fact that opportunities for investment are so numerous, 
I think the more creative way of looking, looking at it is what are the creative ways in which the diaspora community either individually or collectively can suggest some investment opportunities which would give them high rates of return in which uh, they can make a more long-term investment in India. Uh, thank you, sir. I, just, I mean, we are running out of time, but uh, I want to give a chance to my younger colleague, Santosh Bhatt, uh, to who has been waiting to raise a question. Over to you, Santosh. Go ahead, please. You are muted. Yeah. yeah. Now we can hear Go ahead. We can't hear. Can you repeat your question because we do not hear you are here. Something wrong. Anyhow, uh, so Santosh, I think your uh, your connection is still going muted. You are. Yeah. Can you try now? No, we can't hear you. Any, anyway, I think it's, since it's time uh, to, to close uh, this, uh, I must say that uh, there could not have been a better start for this lecture series uh, in honor of uh, our founder, Professor S. K. Goel. I think uh, Mr. N. K. Singh in his talk has covered a very wide ground, uh, touching upon all different challenges that the country faces at this current juncture in terms of raising resources for financing the development and all different uh, challenges in raising and many, uh, sustaining the resources, including his emphasis on a new architecture that needs to be, uh, to be built for our future uh, development. And uh, without that, we will continue to be struggling for resources. And a new India is emerging. We need resources to sustain and power the, uh, its development. And I think, uh, sir, be, besides your very comprehensive and erudite lecture, the, the discussion was really very, very rich and interesting. And so uh, I think we, we, we really benefited a lot from, from your talk. And we look forward to remaining engaged with you as we go along in our journey uh, for uh, industrial transformation of the country uh, with the research that we are doing at uh, the Institute. So I want to really thank you uh, the, uh, on behalf of all of us at ISID, uh, the members of the Board of Governors and all of uh, the participants who were enriched uh, from your talk. Uh, so thank you very much. I want to just check if uh, our chairman wants to say any final words of wisdom. Over to you, sir. <laughs> NK, I'm so glad that you came, you accepted our invitation. And I told Nagesh that you cannot get a better person than the clarity of his thinking is amazing. And he has dwelt on a large number of issues. And uh, the real test will be the seriousness with which the government decides to implement the reforms. Our failure in most areas has been lack of proper or timely or adequate implementation. So the key word is implementation, implementation, implementation. And his concluding observation, I think, is very relevant. The test of success of all these measures lies in whether they were able to transform the lives of the people rather than economy. Yes, economy is transformed, but will it have an impact on the lives of the people? That is the crucial test. And that is a test that will enable the government 
to make a dent in the polls. Another thing that struck me, which was raised, was about diaspora. I think that is an area that needs to be exploited for investment. We are talking about investment. And I think we should organize a full-throated campaign to bring the diaspora here in the field of investment in different fields, and that would make a big difference. So without uh, much ado, NK, thank you once again. And I hope you will visit the Institute again on a in more informal manner, meeting the faculty one-to-one -one discussion. I think that would be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mishra. Thank you, Nagesh. Thank you to everyone for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.